Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, thank you to everyone who was part of the organizing committee, to, uh, including the Institute as well as Dr. Saundarya to, um, for inviting me and having me over. Uh, that lineup was a hard one to match. <laughs> I have no clue how uh, I'm going to tell my story as entertainingly or as impactfully as um, everyone here has uh, told their stories. But I'll speak from my heart, and that's the best. That that's that's what I do best. I I, I try and speak as truthfully as I can. A um, couple of things that I want to say before I start off is that. Um, some things I say might be triggering to some women, maybe men here. Um, I hope you'll bear with me for that. I'm going to go back to when I was nine years old. <coughs> it was the first time a man had touched me without my consent. I was walking down the street with my parents, and there was a stranger coming from the opposite direction. I had no breasts. There was no chest to talk of. A nine-year-old. You know what bodies of nine-year-olds are like. They're flat as boards. This man coming from the opposite direction grabbed my chest. I couldn't explain it for the longest time <coughs> what had happened. I didn't tell my parents. And then I realized that became a part of my life every single day. Well, uh, every time I stepped out in public and if it was crowded. I'm not sure many women exist in India where they haven't been grabbed, pinched, groped in public spaces. Uh, a lot of us, my mother taught me when I was 14 years old, the first time I turned around and hit someone with whatever I had in my hand. I turned around and whacked the man who was rubbing himself up against me. My mother was horrified, and she said, what's going to happen if he comes after you? And that's the first fear parents put in us, right? Protect yourself. Don't do anything that will anger a man, because your bodily integrity is bigger than you feeling like you fought back. Forget about fighting back. Your virginity needs to be safe. That's, that's, at the, that's at the bottom of a parent telling you, don't fight back. They'll come back and do something to you. Now, of course, it goes from rape to murder, which is, um, but it was hard. It was hard to not beat someone up when they came and grabbed me, when they came and said lewd things to me. I remember a time when uh, my friends had certified I was insane when we were walking down the street and there was a guy cycling from the opposite direction. He said something in Malayalam that I'm, I'm a Malayali, not, uh, my Malayalam then wasn't very great. Um, he said something that sounded very lewd to me. And I turned around and looked at him, but he cycled past. He had the audacity to cycle back, come back, and grab my butt. Right? I was 16 years old. I was so mad, I ran after him. He's cycling as if nothing's happened. He's um, cycling fairly slowly. I ran after him, grabbed his collar. He fell off the cycle. Uh, I didn't let go of him, and I started to like, kick and punch him. And there were two of my friends standing there wondering what's going on, because they had no idea of what was happening. I, I know it's overreaction, but I don't know if it is overreaction. You know what I mean? And uh, he squiggled out of his shirt, so I had my, by the time I was done kicking him, he squiggled out of his shirt, run away, his cycle was there, I was still so mad, I started to hop on the cycle. And I'm not a, like a petite girl, as you can clearly see, even at 16 I was fairly strong, and the cycle was bent out of shape. I think it was at that point that I realized that the rage that I feel when I'm touched without permission is a rage I have never seen any woman in my life express. I hadn't seen my mother express it, but she's had those experiences. I hadn't seen my aunts, my friends. We hold that rage back. And I don't know if it's that rage that sort of propels us through difficult situations, like um, Parveen's situation, where she's like, take care of my kid. I'm going to go and find a better life for myself. Or what Veena said, you know what? Hire me. I can protect you. I, I, I honestly think it's rage that keeps women going. And we smile through that rage. <coughs> um, through most of my 20s, I worked with newspapers here in Bombay. And um, it was mostly today. Today, if we have the kind of environment in newspapers that we had then, which is back in the early 2000s, uh, we'd call it highly sexist. Right? Men were constantly making comments about the clothes that women wore. Um, they were propositioning women a lot. They were 
uh, talking to women like, you know that double speak some men do, where they say, hey, we are, we are friends, you're just like us, you're one of us, but they're slipping in a little note of, do you want to come back home with me tonight because you're so drunk? Or why aren't you drinking enough? This was rife in newspaper offices and the media um, back in the early 2000s. I hope things are different. I, I don't work full time anymore. Um, <coughs> when I was 24, um, I was working with a newspaper. I was part of the launch team of a newspaper called VNA. I don't, I don't think it exists anymore in print form. Um, our executive editor was um, Miss was was uh, was an uh, elderly gentleman who uh, was extremely good at his work, very suave, very well spoken, extremely pl polite, treated us all beautifully. Um, his executive assistant was a very good friend of mine, and he had just moved back to Bombay from New York, I think. And he said, you and Sandhya go out all the time. Uh, how come you never invite me? And I haven't seen Bombay in ages. And you know, what are the cool places that you guys go to? So one evening, we were invited out. We invited him out. And this is a man at that point, easily in his late 50s or 60s. Um, we had coffee. We had dinner, whatever. It was late in the night. And he offered to drop us both home. Uh, we were happy to take a rick back home, but he offered to drop us home. And we felt safe, right? We're 24-year-olds. And this is a gentleman who is probably older than my father was at that at that point. <coughs> he said yes. So my friend got dropped off first. And um, then he dropped me. And it was close to 1 AM. And um, when I said goodnight to him, he grabbed my face and kissed me on the mouth. And that was the first time as an adult woman who had just left a marriage behind, um, I felt violated in that sense by someone I knew. It's oh, it's it, it was easier for me to handle strangers walking down the road saying uh, lewd things or people grabbing you. But to have someone respect you, somebody in a position of power, authority, doing that to you, I had no idea how to react. My reaction was quickly to jump out of the car, say goodnight, went home, called my friend, and I started laughing on the phone. Uh, I'm 40 now. Uh, 16 years hence, I, I can't understand that reaction except to call it shock. And I said, look, this is what happened. And both of us were laughing. These are 24 years. And it's not lighthearted laughing. It's that nervous laughing from anger, from not knowing what to do, all of that. That was the first time that I was sexually harassed at work. Uh, requests to travel with him on weekends continued. I couldn't avoid this man. This man was on every edit editorial meeting of mine. This man was finally my super boss, right? My bosses reported to him, and you know he was constantly around with us. So that was the first time I, um, I didn't know what to do. I mean, quitting was not an option for me. And this, I think, uh, is at the heart of what I'm, what I'm trying to say. Everyone I spoke to this about, colleagues, said, oh, this happens all the time, so you can you know, just learn to live with it. Um, my parents said, quit that job. Um, my male friend said, quit that job, move to somewhere better. And I can understand the live with it bit because a lot of my older colleagues experienced that in their lifetimes and that's how they handled it. Um, I can understand it, I don't approve, but I couldn't get this quit that job because what, what does that mean for me? It means, hey, you have the option of being unemployed for a few months or however long it takes to find a new job. It also means a break in your career, which means your ambition is not so important. It is your guarding your, what's the word, honor, that misplaced word, honor, that's more important. Um, quitting was not an option for me. I was in Bombay, and it was an expensive city. I have family here, but it was not an option to go and stay with them. I continued working with that man day in and day out. Um, like I said, request to travel with him on weekends, go out to dinner with him, all of that happened. I didn't make a complaint. At 24, I didn't even know that there was the Posh Act that was in effect from the Vishakha guidelines. Um, I didn't even know who to approach. In 2008, since then I've had about three instances of men behaving extremely inappropriately in a work situation. Um, one of them is now 
uh, a comp uh, as a complaint with the NCW as well as with Bangalore Police, which I'm ex which I'm um, pursuing as a criminal complaint because this man threatened to sue me for defamation, which I will go back to for uh, in 2018. Um, I happen to speak about three instances of uh, harassment, sexual harassment at work on my Twitter timeline. Uh, I have a moderately small presence on Twitter, um, but I tweet a lot. So uh, I guess there's constant buzz around my timeline. Um, <coughs> I started to speak about what had happened. And I'd done this a few years ago, about eight years before that, I'd done it on my blog, where I had listed out every instance of uh, sexual assault, abuse, um, molestation, since the time I was nine years old, without taking any names. But this time I said, you know what? I'm just going to look around. And that you have to remember, 2017 was the year Me Too broke in the US. And there was one year of all of us women wondering why were we keeping quiet and what is the next step, right? How can we keep quiet? How can we not keep quiet? Basically, um, sort of trying to understand the politics of not keeping quiet and why we keep quiet. So one year of that in our minds, and then 2018, I saw, um, I saw a particularly badly phrased apology by a man who had uh, asked, who had spoken inappropriately to uh, a young woman, and he had posted it on social media, had the audacity to post a very bad apology on social media. And I think that's when something tripped. And I took names of, the of two very senior popular editors in uh, Indian newspapers. And it was simultaneous with two, three other women talking about their experience. And for a year and a half now, my life hasn't been the same. Um, a little about my personal background. I'm a single mother of two children. My children are 11 and 10. I was diagnosed with two mental illnesses, which keep getting thrown in my face, saying, oh, you know, none of that happened with you. You are bipolar, so you've just decided that this happened with you. Where's the proof? If a guy grabbed you, if a man kissed you, where's the proof? I'm like, how many people go around with a video camera when they're being dropped off by their boss or alone in a room with a boss? <coughs> Um, and since 2018, I've been unemployable full-time because nobody wants an activist in their newsroom. Um, do I regret taking that step and calling men out the way I did? I don't. I do it all over again, exactly the same way. What I would do differently, however, is sleep a little more because <laughs> I spent three months putting out stories on Twitter of women who had... <coughs> Um, experience of harassment at work. Um, a lot of the time I get the criticism saying, how do you know these women are telling the truth? Why don't you believe, why, why do you believe only the woman and why not the man? I find it extremely hard, extremely hard to believe that a woman would put her name, her career, her reputation at risk when she's calling a man out. The anonymous ones, the women who, they say, okay, what about women who put out, who call men out anonymously? Um, as a journalist, I think I did due diligence for, for what was possible. I can't go out and reach out to every man that um, a harasser was associated with and ask him, hey, did you do this and what was it like? But as far as I know, I put out 300 cases between uh, October 5th, 2018 to January, to February 2019. Of those 300 cases, I think I'm only suspicious of two cases. Everyone else is proud to put their name, not proud, but it's, it's they're unafraid to put their name behind it and say, hey, I made this accusation. All these women have paid a price. Um, it's not just me. I know at least four women who've been in that fight and who do not have a job right now. They freelance, they depend on their husbands, uh, they depend on their savings. Um, a lot of us have ruined general reputations that we've built over 15 years. I have 16 years of journalism experience behind me. Um, everyone's really nice to talk to. So I go to the interviews and I talk to people and you know they say, we'd love to have you on board. And then just before we talk, hey, where's the offer letter? I get a sort of backdoor bit of information that says, oh, you know, because you were involved in the Me Too movement, um, 
there are legal issues to things. Till now, I've had that experience thrice. No one's been able to explain to me what the legal issues are that a company would face if they hired me. And this, I think, is at the heart of, combined with the fact that I'm talking about ambition of a woman and how it's disregarded deeply. A woman is ambitious only because she wants to, um, she wants to wear pretty things or have pretty things. She's ambitious only because she's got kids to take care of. Literally nobody believes that a woman could have ambition because she's ambitious and that's it. She wants to make something of herself. And for me, this is interesting. We never question a man's ambition. We say, oh yeah, he takes care of his family and he takes care of everything. And he likes to, you know, sort of, he's good at what he does. A woman rarely gets credited with plain ambition. It's always for something. She's either working because she wants pocket money. She's either working because, um, you know, she wants to help her husband, not because she wants to. Which is why it's easy to sort of tell women, oh, you don't need a job. You can stay at home. When I combine ambition with what I talk about to corporates, I do posh training for uh, corporates. I, I try and do a workshop from a humane sort of space and not like a boring PowerPoint where we have the laws written down. I try and do, I try and come from a place of experience and how difficult it is to um, go to the police to complain about a man grabbing you, go to HR, who's supposed to keep quiet about a complaint, but never really does. And this is, this is the thing that I try to sort of talk about, that if you want to make a difference to women, it's not Women's Day roses, it's not Women's Day speeches, it's not Women's Day events. It really is these little things, right? Have a better IC, have a better uh, method, not once in a year training for posh, have, like, have it every six months, have people talk about this. Um, who was it in the talk who said, somebody said, uncomfortable things come up when we have posh training. I think it was you, Dr. Sandarya, who said uncomfortable things come up, and then, yeah, they will come up. I mean, and, and the way to clear out that place, in my experience, is to sort of <coughs> have those uncomfortable conversations. As someone who struggles with two mental illnesses, with two growing children, and a source of income that is sporadic, that keeps me going, I want to yell and shout at corporate saying you can do so much better by women, either by a lot of you, the way you've come back from career breaks. Um, and it, it's heartbreaking to hear what they said, right? 40% cut in a salary. I, I don't, I, I really, you know, there are women who run households, there are women like me who run full households, who run full families. How do you justify things like that? Um, if I have to talk personally about my life, my story, there's a lot to say. But like I said, everyone else had, has had such fascinating stories. Mine, I'm just beginning. And I'm not going to stop. So that's what keeps me going when I see women like this who say, you know, this is what, like, Parveen's story just blew my mind, right? And that's, in 10 years, I hope to change the way corporates look at women and the resource that they are. Not just to hire women because it's diverse, but hire women because of what they bring to the table, which really we haven't defined, right? We don't define what women bring to the table apart from, okay, you have the skills, you have the talent, but what else do they bring? There is that mythical, magical thing that women, like she said, she had a baby and she's like, I'm not afraid of it anymore. You know, nothing, I there's a fearlessness that women bring. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping with my story, taking my story ahead um, of fighting the case that I fight now, which I go to the police station for every two months, <coughs> and the person who harassed me doesn't turn up. Uh, I hope fighting that sets an example for women who still will not talk about when they were harassed, when they were misbehaved with. A trusting environment at work at automatically means a more productive woman. And I hope corporates can take that back and build on that. Thank you. <laughs>